Hello everybody and welcome to Commodity Culture where we break down the commodity space for both new and experienced investors. Before we get started, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investing advice. Do your own due diligence. And today's guest is a 40-year professional trader, member of the CME, author of Bubba's Guide to Trading Options, and the founder and chief strategist of BubbaTrading.com. It's Todd Bubba Horowitz. Great to have you on the show. Jesse, it's great to be with you. Thanks for seeking me out. Yes, I've been watching your interviews for a long time now and always wanted to talk to you, so I'm very excited. And I want to kick things off like I do with all new guests with their origin story. So how did you first discover investing in trading? How did you develop an interest in the commodity space? And how did that road ultimately lead you to where you are today? Well, it's kind of a backward story, but I'll give you the quick Cliff Notes version. Uh, I was a salesperson back in the 70s. And in those days, they didn't have age discrimination and they, I was the number one salesman, but they wouldn't promote me. And I said, well, you can take this job and you know what you can do with it. And uh, I knew some guys that were down on the SIBO, the Chicago Board of Options Exchange. And I went down, took the test and started trading options uh, back in, in 1980. And then uh, my family, my dad was a truck driver, a meat peddler, and my mom was from a farm. And I learned the commodity business, you know, as working with my father and, and, and my, my relatives and became a, a quite the hedger in, uh, in the grain markets as well. So I'm, I'm pretty well versed and been on all three floors in Chicago. Yeah, that's amazing. So when it comes to trading versus investing, you know, everybody thinks that trading, who isn't familiar, thinks trading is a way to make money quickly. Um, people don't want to be patient. Most investors, their time horizon, is, as Rick Rule likes to say, is a long weekend or, or, or around that. So how does, is, is trading something that is kind of innate in you? Is it something that you just kind of were drawn to and were able to do? Um, is it is it a certain psychology that someone needs to approach trading versus investing? Uh, what, what's your take there? It's all about psychology it is, you know, you, you have to understand uh, what you're trying to accomplish. You know, I mean, I'm a, I'm a trader and I'm an investor. And, you know, you have to understand what the statistics of both are and what you're trying to gain. Uh, you know, if you're trying to, you know, if you're looking at your 401k every 10 minutes, you should go see a doctor and have your head examined because, it's not going to change and you're not getting out. So why irritate yourself by looking and creating a panic situation when you're actively trading, you're trading under a different menu and you're looking at, at different, maybe different time frames. Like, for example, I'll trade numerous time frames, but I trade live every morning with my members. We use four minutes. So for us, four minutes is a long term capital gain. Uh, but we also have a stop because remember, trading is not easy and you will have losses and you're going to have to deal with the drawdown part of the business, whether you're investing or trading. And, and that's where most people fail is they either try to time the market, they fall into the news cycle, which is going to hurt them very badly because the news is always wrong and it's always late. By the time you hear a news item, figure you're the one millionth person to have heard that news. The markets have already played it out long over. And so if somebody decides, I want to give trading a shot, what do you think the path there is? How much education should one undergo? And how does one get that education as opposed to long-term investing? You know, um, Benjamin Graham, that, that, that style approach. How does one become a trader? How does one educate themselves on, on that? Well, there's, there's, uh, there's educators like myself, but there's good educators out there, but it, it takes practice. It takes observing the market. It takes learning how to read a chart, read, as they say, the price action or the footprint. You know, markets leave a footprint, right? Everything, whether you're trading in markets or you're a retail store, you have a chart that shows you a footprint of what your sales were or what the markets are going to do. But you have to be A, prepared to take a loss if you're wrong, but your education is ongoing. You know, I'm 44 years doing this and I'm still learning. I try to learn something new every single day about markets because, again, depending on what you're trading, right? You can trade options, you can trade futures, you can trade stocks, you can trade other derivatives. You must understand what you're trying to trade and the risk that goes along with it. And the biggest problem, and most people, and what they have to learn first, is do not over leverage your position nor your cash because in this business, cash is king and the ability to be able to get into something when the opportunity arises, you have to have the money to do so and you can't be over leveraged or in a bad mood and not be able to make the next trade because the last trade was a losing trade. Very interesting. So I'd like to take a step back and get your macro view of the broad markets at the moment. So 
What is your view of where the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ currently stand? I know at least when it comes to the S&P, it feels like a few big names are holding that particular index up, kind of masking the bigger picture and the pain kind of lying beneath the waters. So would you agree with that? And do you think there's more significant downside to come up ahead? Well, let me give you a full disclosure. Okay, I have positions and I am basically long as a trader right now, the markets, because the markets suggest that there, you should be long here. However, okay, I am, I do believe that we are going down 50 to 70% total, which takes in last year's losses in, in, in consideration, because this has been my call for quite a while. The real problem is you cannot time when this market's going to break. But there are many, many warning signs out there. And for example, you go into the banking sector, you know, we're going to get stuck banging out the banks again. Uh, we've already seen a couple of banks go under. And if you think that, that they have a handle on it, they don't. And we're going to see a massive meltdown in these banks. You're already seeing interest rates rising. You're seeing mortgage rates over 7%, which is hurting the housing market. I would, I would suggest we will see a replay of 2008-9. And, and remember, that markets just don't go down one day. Everybody likes to always point to one particular period. But the markets have shown a lot of overall weakness coming into this. Now, again, although I'm long because right now the chart suggests it, but volume is extremely light. Complacency is at, at record levels. We have too much debt. There's all kinds of reasons we should be lower, but you're not. So you want to go with the path of least resistance, but recognize that you'll be able to turn it over. You don't need to predict markets to make money, you need to be able to go with the trend when it changes. And right now the trend is still slightly higher. So until that changes, I'll be long, but I'm willing to pull the trigger and get short when that time is coming. So when you say you're long, what does that time horizon look like for you? It can, it's day by day. These are, I, I trade another model that I trade is it's swing trade. And I am in, I am in 29 commodity markets, long or short every day of the year. I'm never out. I'm either long or I'm short. Okay. And right now we're net long, uh, the equity markets right now. And, you know, and also in equity, we use, we create some equity synthetic, uh, stock portfolios as well. So we're long there as well, net. But at the end of the day, okay, I'm, I know and I do feel and I think I'm right that there's going to be a, a dramatic, massive sell off. You know, I've, I've traded on the floor through 1987, through 2001 and through 2008. And I don't think this is going to be any different. I think we're going to see a major meltdown. But again, you'll have plenty of time. I think people get too impatient or too nervous thinking that it's going to happen in one day and it doesn't happen in one day. It's over time. And you've seen, for example, this past week, a lot of selling uh, and then you had a big a big rally. Uh, so again, the rally was natural. You should have expected the rally because markets don't go straight up or straight down. Yeah, and I think people get caught up in the day-to-day -day noise on social media as well. This is the first era where you can get up to the second news on FinTwit. So I, I think that that either makes people jubilant and excited when something goes up or despair when it goes down without looking at the longer term picture. So I do want to switch to commodities now, starting with agricultural commodities. This is a sector of the commodity space that isn't discussed very often. So I'm just wondering if you see any opportunities in agriculture long term, and if so, which commodities in that space present the best value proposition in your view? Well, I think commodities are, are set up for what we call a big market. Okay, which means you're going up a lot. That's my my view. Uh, it's been my view, and I've had to suffer through it. But it, to me, it appeared that the grain markets made lows on Monday. Okay, uh, on Monday, uh, the first of uh, May. Okay, and and that looks like a bottom. And I think what you'll see is we could see a dramatic move. Now, if I were to pick one, you know, either soybeans, wheat, or corn, I would take wheat. Wheat has been under the most immense pressure, and it really doesn't make sense. You know, we have one major problem and commodities right now, and that is that the, the retail price with inflation is exploding higher, but the wholesale price for farmers is not. Their input costs are getting so much higher that their profit margins are ridiculously low. So they're depending on hopefully some bad weather to raise prices. But we're going to have to, some, somewhere that's going to adjust, and I think that's part of the big market that I'm looking for, is that we'll, it'll adjust there. And if I were to pick one, I would buy wheat. Because wheat has been depressed. It was $13 about a year ago. It's now $6.5. And how does an investor get exposure to, to wheat if they're not a short-term trader? Because I'm guessing, are you trading futures? How, how are you approaching the sector? And how would somebody with a long-term view uh, approach the sector? I do both. But I'm holding it. Listen, I, I will, me like a farmer, the farmers will put their grains in a bin. 
I'll put my gra my grains in an account, okay, and I'll hold them and I'll roll them. You know, you have to expire every. You know, you've got new new crop, old crop, but I'll roll until I until they go in my direction, unless I feel that something has changed. So I, an average investor can buy, um, you know, come futures because it's just like buying an equity. And now with the advent of mini and micro uh, uh, commodities. I mean, you know, they can get in involved. I mean, there is, there, there is not a good representation of an ETF that, that properly accounts for wheat or for corn or for soybeans or, or oil for that matter. But, you know, there's, there's a, a thing that goes on within the commodity space, which is called backwardation and contango. And just a quick explanation of what that happens to be. Contango is a natural formation where things just go up. As you go out in time, prices get higher because that would make sense, right? Backwardation is when the front month is the high price, and as you go out in future, it's down. And if you look at the, the grain markets, they're always in backwardation because the, the active trading months are always higher than like new crop. New crop is in, in, in wheat and corn is December, March, okay? And soybeans is November. So that is, the, those, you can always see those are always in backwardation until they turn. Okay, but that's what you watch in the commodity market, and that's why the ETFs don't have a good representation. And I would never recommend a wheat or a corn or a soybean ETF. I wanted to get your thoughts on precious metals and how you see them performing up ahead, and starting with gold, because as we were talking about the banking crisis, a lot of people seem to be pulling out their money out of banks and looking for a flight to safety. And of course, Correlation doesn't always equal causation, but a lot of people are pointing to the fact that that's why gold could be doing so well right now. So I'd like to get your thoughts there and how you see gold performing and then get your thoughts on silver as well. Well, I think gold's going to new highs. I mean, I've made that very clear for the last six or seven months that we're going to see new highs this year now. You know, how high? I, I, you know, I, listen, for me to give a number would be kind of silly, but let's say, you know, 2300, Okay. I mean, you know, we may get the, you know, everybody's calling 5,000, 10,000. That's so much of garbage. Okay. It may get there someday, but it's not getting there without a lot of resistance on the way. I don't look at gold or, or silver as a safe haven, though. See, I look at gold or silver as, as hard assets. Okay. That are like a currency. And you can already see a number of states are trying to get approval to use gold and silver as a currency again, which they should be. Right. Uh, but I think gold is going to continue to go higher. I mean, we've seen some dramatic moves. But I would think that the next big move will be higher, and I think it will take us to all-time new highs and, and possibly higher. And again, I don't know when it will stop, but right now it, the action has actually been very, very bullish. You know, anytime you get a market that makes a charge higher and then has a pullback, that's natural strength, and the support gets bought and bought up it goes again. And silver, I, figure, I would suspect silver will get into the mid-30s this year. Uh, I don't think it'll make a new high because the high was what I think forty nine sixty five or something like that. I mean that's obviously was a little bit ridiculous at the time. Now eventually, I do think that silver will get very high, and I think platinum will will make a dramatic recovery as well because platinum at one time was well over gold. Now it's well under gold, and I think that that I think if you're looking for a value play, I think plat there's no better value than platinum right now. Interesting. I'd like to hear your views on oil and gas as well. This is a sector I'm personally bullish on for the long term. I think this rush to force, force in renewable energy will ultimately fail. I mean, maybe someday, but it's not happening anytime soon. And we're already starting to see big institutional investors turn their back on ESG mandates because of how unsustainable they are. So where do you see oil and gas positioned? And will we be needing fossil fuels for the foreseeable future in your view? We're going to need fossil fuels for a long, long time. The, the, first of all, the, the renewable, the climate change garbage. Now, again, I don't, if you believe in climate change, I have no problem. I don't. But again, let's say you do. Okay. We need a plan. We need, how are we going to get to step one? You know, when they shut down the oil production in the United States, that was stupid because you, you, you immediately forced inflation to go to the moon. Whereas you could still be producing oil instead of paying 5,000 of the pump, you'd still be paying in the twos. So they've done this, but almost done it intentionally. Again, you want to get the green energy? I got no problem with it. But you've got to have a plan and an area. And, and, and in my presidential elections that I voted in, which goes back to 1976, every single candidate has promised to fix the infrastructure. Not one has done so yet. And you, until you fix the infrastructure, you don't have the power grid to, to charge up all these vehicles that they want to put on the road. So I think oil and gas are going much higher. I think, in fact, if you go back and look at, at, at Wednesday, March, excuse me, May the 3rd, we had a panic sell-off low that hit about $63, okay? 
and gold immediately gold oil immediately turned around and ran is over and it got back over 70. I would I wouldn't be surprised that would be over 100 by summer. Okay, and I wouldn't be surprised if we make all two new, new, time new highs again. I believe, in my opinion, I called in, in January, I said that Saudi Arabia was in a cut production going into driving season. Well, they caught me a month early. They did it at the end of, of, end of March, early April. Now, I, I still believe there's going to be one more cut before Memorial Day, which will drive prices to probably an average of $5 throughout the country, probably 7 or $8 in California. And do you have any thoughts on natural gas here? Because it, it fell dramatically from seemingly very high levels. It was at around $9 and now hovering around $2 and change. Um, do you think this presents a buying opportunity? Do you, do you see natural gas going up in, uh, here in 2023? I do think that it's okay. And I think here's the perfect example of a contango formation. Okay. You got natural gas in the mid two or the low twos now. If you look out in October, it's in the mid threes. Okay. Uh, and of course, that goes in the season. Remember, natural gas is more seasonal than anything else, right? So you're in the time of year that there's not a big demand for natural gas. It's more used for heating, for farming, and for a lot of things that we use. So the demand doesn't come in until later in the year, usually, and it usually makes the first big jump in the first cold snap. So you know, we've got plenty of natural gas. This is another problem that we, you know, we've created a number of these problems for ourselves. We've got in this country today, an over 200 year supply of current usage of both fossil fuel, natural gas and crude oil. But they refuse to get it because of, of course, the climate change as they continue to open new coal plants all over the world. So we're not going to change the climate when 47% of the population is burning a record amount of coal, which is China and, and India together. They represent 47%. So again, we got a problem, but I do think gas and oil and natural gas are going much, much higher. And what about coal then? Um, because, you know, we're burning more, more of it than ever all over the world. We saw, you know, Europe bid up the prices of LNG during the energy crisis and causing countries like Pakistan to get outbid. And now they're taking a harder turn into burning coal, something that they can afford and that is a very efficient source of energy. So do you think the price of coal will also be going higher up ahead? I do. I think, listen, you're going to have more burning of coal. You're, you cannot do what this administration is trying to do. Okay. You can't do it the way they're trying to do it. And you're seeing there's a record amount of new coal plants being built. And of course, we destructed our own coal business. And I'm not saying that that was right or wrong. I'm saying that you destroyed something in 08 when you, when you shut down the, the mines in West Virginia and in Kentucky. Okay, you put a lot of people out of work for no reason. And of course, you put out a lot of production and, and it's not changing. You know, the United States has the cleanest environment in the world. Okay, so, you know, you can't change what everybody else does. You can't put a dome over the United States. So I think coal is going to continue to be burned. It's the cheapest source of energy. And if they keep screwing around with oil and if the United States is not going to be a net exporter of oil, then it, where, where's people going to go? They're going to go to coal. They're going to go to the next cheapest source, which is coal. So it sounds like you're not bullish on the new green economy and, and that all coming together, um, especially the way that these politicians are pushing it. So I wonder what your view is on battery metals such as lithium. Do you think they could still benefit because the powers that be are going to try to force through these policies, force EV adoption, or, or do you think there's, there's a lot of hype in the space that's maybe unwarranted? Well, I mean, I think lithium better be fine when they figure them out to a regular science. I mean, we really don't have the space figured out yet. I, I listen. I think Tesla is a great vehicle, and I, I think that you know the there, there's going to be a need. And if we would do it properly, see the problem is it's how you do things, right? And, and I think that if they do it properly, there'll be a big demand for that. But we put ourselves in such a bad position that nothing prospers, everything fails. Uh, you know, certainly. If I could find a good company that made money in the lithium based battery space, again, remember, make money. They have to be profitable before I want to invest them. I'm not looking for startups. I'm not looking to take a big risk here. But if you can give me one that's profitable, because there's, listen, we're going to see an evolution. We've seen it from, you know, the horse and buggy to, to, to the Model T to what we have today. So it's going to change. And, but first of all, as we know, who runs big, who runs government? Big oil right now. It used to be big tobacco and big oil. Now it's big oil. So until big oil has it figured out and they can get in that green energy space, we're going to continue to see these issues and problems as, uh, go forward. And I, eventually, I'm sure there might even be the solution, but the, we just haven't seen it yet.
So for your average investor out there, somebody who maybe doesn't have a ton of time to devote to investing and, and to devote to examining all of these different asset classes, what do you think is the best way to preserve wealth given that you're seeing a potential big drawdown in the market up ahead? Is it putting cash in short-term T-bills to at least try to preserve some of your wealth from inflation? Is it getting a hold of some silver and gold bullion? Um, yes. what, what, what's your view there on somebody who's just trying yes. to preserve their wealth? All, all of the above, whatever you have. You, first of all, the greatest return in the history of any asset class is the stock market. Okay, it returns eight and a half percent year over year in history. Uh, and again, even if it's going to have a drawdown, it gives you a chance to buy more. Now, if I were somebody brand new and just starting to invest today, depending on how much money I had, but I would split it probably in three ways and take half of it and put it in, in short term CDs, which are paying almost five percent right now. Okay, because again, five percent to eight and a half percent when you're expecting a drawdown and you get a weak economy, not so bad. Okay, I would take you know probably twenty five percent or twenty percent and put it in precious metals and the balance I put in the equity market. So I'd balance out my portfolio, I'd balance out my investment, and knowing that the cash that is in my CD that's accumulating at five percent annually over three month periods, that I would eventually be putting that into the equity market because I I, I believe that the right ratio is probably. 80% equities, 20% precious metals. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Todd. A ton of wisdom shared. For those who'd like to learn more, could you tell us about Bubba Trading and anywhere else you'd like to direct people online? Sure. No, absolutely. Bubba Trading, I've, I've been doing this you know, for 44 years. And uh, it, Bubba Trading has been around for that long. But as an edu I became an educator when the floor basically closed down. And you can go to my web website at BubbaTrading.com and check it out. I've got a number of different. We trade every product there is. If it moves, we'll trade it. Uh, and I do teach. I have live classes. I've written two books on options. And you know, certainly if you want to email me direct and ask me a question, feel free to do so at Bubba at BubbaTrading.com. And you can join me if you ever want to on my Monday night webinar, which I just go through uh, all the markets, the commodities and stocks. And we go through charts and do everything like that. So I'd love to help you if you have questions. Again, no, no obligation. You're welcome to reach out to me. I'll be happy to educate you at no cost. Great. Well, I'll put links to all that in the description below. Thank you once again for joining us and would love to have you on at some point in the future to continue the conversation. Thanks, Jesse. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.